Hello, everyone. Happy Saturday. The Ham Radio Concepts Podcast. I am Eric, KJ4YZI. We have a special guest I'll have with me today on a very wide open and non-scripted, non-planned uh, podcast. But as usual, this podcast goes wherever it wants. But a really uh, fitting topic uh, this weekend... Uh, we people have been preparing, and uh, you know it's hurricane season. It's the peak of hurricane season. So what happens is uh, you get the storms start spooling up in September, October, you know, beginning of October, and some people still aren't prepared, and there they go out to the stores, uh, freaking out, and now you can't go to get stuff to make tacos because the lines are 20, 30 miles long. So. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, it's now shifting. So the, the track yesterday, uh, and the track I told you about a couple days ago on the podcast is not coming, appears to not be coming. You can do it at once, but it doesn't look like it was a couple days ago and it looks like it's going to change again. So it looks like now more towards uh, favored toward the big bend area panhandle. Uh, but we'll see what happens. The key is to be prepared. And, um, the, the guest that I have, my friend Joe, that, uh, I'll introduce here. Uh, this is Joe, WB4HIS. Go ahead, Joe. Say hello. Well, hello, everyone out there in radio land and ships at sea. <laughs> Joe is uh, another, um, a very experienced ham and uh, has a whole uh, roster and uh, uh, different uh, careers he's been in and stuff. But the one thing I, I wanted to communicate with on a podcast with Joe is because Joe... Um, yeah, I made a video about this topic a couple of years ago, and uh, a lot of people may have not seen that. And it's just fitting for, you know, as I've said, when there's emergencies or natural disasters or hurricanes or wherever you live, ham radio always seems to prevail. A ham radio is always something that uh, is is uh, there when everything else is not, you know. And uh, Joe has a really good uh, knowledge of the Sarnet system, S A R N E T. That's a statewide amateur radio network. Correct, uh, Joe? That is correct. And and this is uh, I'll let Joe talk about it. This is uh, a, a very. Some people have told me in the video. They said I wish we had something like that in our state. And uh, others said, Well, you know, will this go down with storms? And and a lot of people don't understand what it is. So I'll let Joe talk for a little bit, and we'll just pass it back and forth. There's nothing scripted or. Joe, please feel free to just talk however you want, man. It's just a, a mediocre at best podcast, but I think everybody's going to like to hear about the Sarnet. So <laughs> go ahead, sir. Okay, Eric. Well, thanks a lot. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarnet, uh, of course, is a statewide amateur radio network. It is. It started out probably about, oh, eight years or so, nine years ago um, when... Um, uh, Randy, AG4UU, who at that time worked for the uh, Florida Department of Transportation, uh, came up with a pilot. Uh, DOT at that time was getting into um, uh, multicast uh, communications on their land mobile radio network. And basically, we sort of used. Uh, ham radio is a test bed for some of the the concepts uh, that uh, FDOT was was going to use. So this is another instance of amateur radio sort of preceding uh, you know a, a communications uh, uh, mode I guess that uh, is, is you know in use today. Right. Um, it started out with, I think, about three sites up in the north end of uh, Florida, Tallahassee, I believe uh, Lake City was one, and I believe Jacksonville. And uh, we had some <clears throat> voice over IP equipment uh, that uh, would do multicast. And uh, basically, with the, the multicast system, just to sort of explain it, real briefly is it's it's a radio interface uh, a lot of times referred to as radio over IP ROIP um, and it would interface into a radio you have to have of course push to talk you have to have a, a COR or carrier operated relay or some some way to uh, detect that the signal is there 
And then it would take the audio, say from a speaker or uh, uh, somewhere in the, in the receiver where, where you would pick off you know, good constant audio and convert that to uh, digital. And the digital would be sent over uh, an ethernet connection to the other units. Now, what sort of happens in the uh, multicast world is when someone, let's say they're in Tallahassee, comes on the radio and starts to make a call, the, the radio over IP unit will receive that and it will start sending data to the other uh, uh, radio over IP units. And these will, uh, essentially it becomes like the master and the other units are slave units. So they're getting the information essentially at the same time. Uh, if there's any course delays on the network or anything too, that, uh, that enters into it. But they essentially would key up the transmitter at those remote locations and essentially convert the digital uh, signal to uh, audio and send it out. And of course, in, in, in other words, yeah. if, if you're in Miami and there's a Sarnet repeater and you key it up, you're lighting up every Sarnet repeater in the state of Florida. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Now there's a little more that happens on the network because of having so many multicast stations, we essentially have a rendezvous point. And um, uh, this rendezvous point right now is located up in the Orlando area. So what happens is the uh, when someone keys up, it starts sending this signal, it's picked up in Orlando and then rebroadcast to all the other units. So essentially though, everyone is coming up on the air at the same time. And you, you could hear some delay sometime. Uh, we do have some delay settings to try to make the system work a little better. Essentially when you uh, start transmitting, your audio is delayed on the network about a second and a half. Um, but this is for to make up for um, uh, transmitter key ups and right, various yeah. other things that would enter in into the network. So, so, so for for those who are wondering, who thinks this is a a uh, 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 you know, we, we might have some people that are just new to ham radio, and <clears throat> for for instance. It, it, Joe will explain why it's just a little bit different. Uh, I know I know some people think, um, it, let's talk about D-Star, uh, just for example, D-Star, C4FM, D, uh, DMR. They may be thinking, well, this network uh, is relying on internet, and when the internet goes down, this is not going to work, so it's no better than a, a, a system fusion system uh, across the county where when the internet goes out, all the, the repeaters are useless. Um Explain how it's different with this, Joe, because right. that's that's one thing different. This is not just a uh, you know right. a, an Ethernet to here, and oh, we got to hope that the AT T Internet stays on, or else we don't use it. You know what I mean? Right. The the Ethernet, okay. Ethernet is of course just a, a form of of data communications. There's certain protocols and everything like that. Most people, yes, are probably familiar with the Ethernet that comes out of their uh, modem. It, it at home and connects up to their computer and that sort of thing and of course it being on the internet now the big difference with the sarnet system though it does not use the internet aha uh -huh. okay and that's really the big secret of it uh we were fortunate enough and and we have now a signed memorandum of understanding uh between the Florida Department of Emergency Management and the Florida Department of Transportation. The Florida Department of Emergency Management is essentially, I guess you would say, the, the sponsor right now of SARNET. And they're looking at, of course, being able to use SARNET for emergency communications because one, it's very reliable. Like I said, we're not using the internet, we're using the Florida Department of Transportation's microwave network that consists of, oh, I think it's about 85 sites thereabouts throughout the state of Florida. These sites essentially are public safety grade type microwave sites. Uh, they have um, very high reliability 
They have backup power. Uh, they're backed up also. Uh, we're getting in now to more uh, use of fiber in the state. So it's a very a redundancy hardened, for everything. <laughs> yes, it's 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 a hardened, uh, redundant type system. Um, the fact is, each of the uh, the tower sites, of course, are uh, now to the I think it's the TIA two twenty two. Um, I think it's G standard. I'm I don't remember the exact designations, but basically they're designed for like two hundred mile an hour winds. Uh, now, the towers we don't expect to come down. Uh, however, it's possible that we could have a microwave dish get, get blown off azimuth, possibly. But that's fairly easy to correct. Uh, in, the, in the past storms, especially Michael, um, and um, oh, I can't remember some of the other storms down here that have, have passed through, if we do lose or have a, a, a dish blown off, Generally, our microwave uh, maintenance contractor can get out fairly rapidly after a storm. We have tower, you know, they have tower people uh, available to go up and, and reline the dishes. So if it's just a matter of turning a dish, that's, that's relatively simple to, to do, and, and we can get the network back up fairly rapidly. Also, if it's just a path between two sites, there's another path because this, the, the microwave network is essentially in a ring type configuration. So there is another path into that site. So we don't really use, lose communication to that site. It just may be the path between the sites. So it could be uh, routed and we're putting in uh, uh, new fancy routers that are smarter than I am. And uh, they can automatically route the traffic and stuff around the network. So, uh, so, <laughs> this is... <laughs> so listen, so listen to that, guys. If you yeah. have a if you have a dish that happens to get moved off path, most of the time there's another second diversity dish or another dish, or if a PA transmitter goes out, there's a second one of those, or if the site completely goes offline, it'll reroute. If you lose power, it goes to generator. If you lose generator, it goes to battery. This mm -hmm. is using radio between sites, so that's what makes it different. When you yes. uh, what the people that say a hot you know D, D Star isn't real ham radio or a hotspot really isn't ham radio. Well, mm -hmm. this is this is using uh, radio at very high you know six gig and eleven gig whatever frequencies right. between sites all the way up and down the entire state with a, a plethora of redundancy. So it would have to be a, 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 a complete statewide failure for all this yeah. like he said like you said really Joe, right catastrophic it, catastrophic that's what i was looking for yeah i mean if you lost a, a link or two in the panhandle everything mm -hmm. uh, going straight down the other side of florida would still work and if there was a way it would reroute around the panhandle correct that that's correct and um even though like uh, across the the panhandle we do use other services and stuff too it might be a lower speed but it there is redundancy that is built into the network to to handle that that sort of event um, and now it's we are of course using essentially IP protocols okay on on the network so it's it's an entirely digital uh, microwave network and um, but it's, not it's but not really not relying at all on a big brand like AT and T or Comcast. Or no, Air that Verizon. is that is correct. There's not relying on any of. They are the carrier. <laughs> right, right. The Department <laughs> of Transportation is the carrier. Uh, they they maintain a, a contract uh, or a contractor to maintain the microwave system. That uh, you know they have like a four hour response time. That if something goes down, to to be, at least be able to get out and assess the issue and everything so it's it's really under the control of of f dot um, and like when we had michael the network essentially did not go down on the panhandle uh, and of course michael was a was a pretty pretty big storm and um, essentially it ended up being where where in some cases sarnet was the only communication that people could use locally in those counties because 
the normal carriers either went out or uh, there were fibers cut or a whole lot of circumstances and, and for the first few hours, um, uh, first day or so, uh, ham radio actually was the only way in and out of some of these counties. Like I said, the bumper sticker used to say, when all else fails, ham radio is there. That's correct. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's a proven uh, thing there. For Was anybody, you, did the SARNET have any traffic utilized for emergency responders or anything like that uh, in conjunction with, you know, members of their hams it, and others? And Yeah, it, it did. As a matter of fact, uh, we have one of the hams down here in Miami um, who uh, does work for a, uh, uh, actually, I think the state fire marshal's office, and they have uh, jump teams that, that will go into the area. As fact, as uh, I just heard them the other day, they were, they were getting ready to, uh, uh, you know, get all their equipment and, and uh, uh, vehicles and saws and all this other stuff that they might need to to clear paths and stuff uh, when, a, when a storm would go in, that when they're, they're dispatched, uh, they essentially, they have a number of hams that, that, that work for them. And if you talk with him, he said, you know, Sarnet was the only way in and out of the area for the first few days. And they were able to keep, keep in contact with one another, uh, shelters and, uh, being able to get supplies for some of the emergency shelters and stuff like that, they they were able to do it over over Sarnet. That's terrific. And, yeah, uh, and there is on the, uh, I think on uh, YouTube, I think if you search for, uh, I think Sarnet, and like, I think it was October. I forget the the year or something like that. But apparently, someone had recorded a lot of the audio. There's like bunch of hours of audio of, of a lot of that communication that's on there. I think it's also we have some on the uh, the Sarnet website, not not quite as extensive, but yeah, for those for those things. interested, I should have mentioned that earlier. For those interested, if you're if you're not familiar with this, the website is www.sarnetfl.com. S A R N E T F L dot com. And you can get, you know, I have this pulled up right here. If you look on there, it tells you a brief uh, you know uh, what is Sarnet? Why was Sarnet started? Uh, is Sarnet only for MCOM? We're gonna get to that in a second. Cause I want to ask Joe a couple questions on that. <laughs> and there are oh, it's you know what? It's right on the website, uh, Joe. Yeah, below are two Sarnet audio clips from Hurricane Michael in October 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, and there's a system map, and and of course how it works. Uh, all that stuff is on there. You get a picture of a tower, the microwave tower, for yeah. example and system maps. So when I go to system maps, it'll show you um, a frequency assignment map, which you can click on and it'll show you if you have a Sarnet rate of repeater in your area. And most likely you could hit Sarnet from somewhere, maybe not every single place with a handheld, but if you have a mobile, I think Joe, is that, is that correct? You can almost yeah, hit Sarnet that, from anywhere. The system essentially, essentially was designed uh, figuring that it would be a, a mobile station, maybe running around 35 watts or so, something in that area. And that's sort of how the system was, was laid out. And it, of course, because it's, it's essentially, it follows the interstates in the, in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. So up I-95, across I-10, down I-75, across Alligator Alley. That's, that's the backbone. Florida Turnpike. Right, the Florida Turnpike, exactly. Um, so, so it's those um, those roadways that essentially Sarnet follows that that backbone because that's where the the DOT tower, tower sites are, is along the interstates. And the right. Turnpike. And, and if you if you go on this website and you look at the Sarnet st uh, 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 coverage map, you can see uh, almost uh, there's a lot of repeaters that overlap coverage. Yes. And uh, so, so you know, maybe you're, I mean, there, there's a lot of opportunity to be able to access the system. I, I only see one little spot here, Hardy County, maybe DeSoto County, that's south of Polk, uh, between Tampa and Vero Beach, out in the middle where there's not one of those uh, highways, like you said. There's just probably yeah. a little gap. And if you, if you had a Yagi, you could hit one of them, you know, a directional Yagi or uh, a higher power uh, radio antenna, you could hit it. But the general... 
oh, idea is you could probably actually get it from actually we are trying and we we hope in the not too distant future. Now we have to coordinate everything with the Florida Department of Transportation. We're a guest on their their system and everything, uh -huh. but we're trying to fill in some of those areas and uh, have talked to some uh, some of the uh, local. Uh, I guess operators in those areas that have access to repeater sites. The thing is, we have to be able to communicate uh, from the backbone over to those sites. But we are looking at uh, even one in, in Highlands County, I think, right now that uh, we're looking at that would hopefully fill in some of the gap in the middle part of the state. I don't think uh, I don't think very many people live in that little gap there. Do they? Is, is it well, like all just nothing out there, farmland? Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> you know a lot of ranches, a lot of farmland and stuff yeah, like that. A lot I mean, of orange groves. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't I don't think that's the hotbed of nighttime tourism there. No, uh, <laughs> but but even still, uh, you know we we do have pretty good coverage, and we're of course trying to fill in down down to uh, to Key West. But a lot of this is taking time because we have to. Uh, the DOT is taking a major upgrade of the microwave system where we are replacing uh, all the microwave equipment with, with current state-of-the-art uh, equipment and increasing the, the bandwidth. Essentially, the bandwidth uh, up to the last years, we had like about 45 megabits uh, per second uh, of, of data throughput that the network would handle. Well. With this newer equipment and these newer routers and everything, it should be up in the 400 megabit per second range. So we're definitely increasing the capacity of, of the, the network, the reliability of the network, and uh, it's, uh, it's no small undertaking. So uh, No, that's, that's, a, that's a huge uh, task at hand. And, yeah, I mean, and, and a, a lot went into making the Sarnet system the way it is, I'm sure. Oh yeah. I mean, for yes. years, you know, uh, of uh, probably, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys did some sort of mapping where you can you have somebody around to see what the range really is. Oh, ab absolutely, ab yeah. absolutely. That's why when you look at that that coverage map and everything, we we picked sites that would hopefully give us a little overlap. There are some areas where we might not have quite as much, but uh, we're trying to fill in. Uh, some of those right now, but essentially you can travel all through the state of Florida on the interstate system and be in contact with someone. If you, if you have, uh, at least if you're going to have a mobile radio, at least have a mag mount antenna on the roof, a gain antenna is preferable, and 3 to 6 dB gain uh, is not that big of an antenna, UHF or, or even VHF. A lot of, I use a dual band uh, VHF, UHF, mag mount, and the time. Uh, a lot of, well, depending upon where I am, I'll just take a handheld with me. But uh, if, uh, uh, usually, like in my own private vehicle, yes, I, I'm using like a uh, 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 a 50 watt, uh, you know, dual band radio, and that that works fine. I'm very rarely out of communication with the Sarnet no matter where I've gone on the inter interstate system. Yeah, I could drive from Vero Beach to pretty much Marathon Key and have uh, mm -hmm. communication on you know, 95 and Turnpike all the way down. Or uh, I went to Tallahassee one time from Vero Beach, and I took mm -hmm. uh, interstates for that. It was like a six-hour drive. And there yep. was always, uh, you know, other than switching through the repeaters, uh, you know, I would re realized where one ended and where one picked up and switch and and uh, that was good. So let me ask you this, Joe. I, mean, I, I know I, I've, I've talked, I've known you for a few years now. I've talked on the radio and stuff. I've listened to Sarnet. I don't, I don't get on her too much. But um, I know that in the, it, there's some people, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll say it this way, then I'll let you correct me. So it said on the website, is it only for emergency? Well, can you explain, you know, I've gotten there and just, Shot the breeze for a minute or two with somebody and it didn't tie it up. Because you got to remember, guys, when you're when you're talking to your, if you're talking to your buddy on the Coco repeater and both of you are ten miles from each other, switch to simplex because you're tying up the entire state of repeaters talking to somebody that you can reach in simplex range. But in a, in a day's day, uh, you know, if there's not a catastrophe and it's January seventh and there's no hurricane season, Joe, 
what's what, what's what would someone expect to hear on there or what what's the 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 ex, you know what what would communication be like on there all right I, I think the main thing is you have to remember that it is a statewide system whenever you press that microphone button and go into one of the repeater sites you are going throughout the whole state of Florida and whatever you say on there everyone in the state of Florida that's in range of a Sarnet repeater is going to hear. Now, we don't have any objection at all to people getting on there and, and having a, a brief QSO. I say brief, but you know, it may depend. Certain times of the day, or if it's in the evening, you know, there's not a whole lot of traffic on there. We don't really like to have a whole lot of rag chewing going on as such. And just remember the topics, you know, there may not be uh, everyone that would be interested in, in how you're weaving this basket or whatever, you know, uh, they might be a little more interested <laughs> in, in technical things, but, uh, you, you know, just, just sort of be considerate uh, of, of the other operators out there. We try to say, too, when you finish uh, transmitting, and I'll, I'll say one thing, this is not a, what I would call a fast break system. Not like on a lot of repeaters where you could, you know, some guy finishes their transmission, the other guy comes on right away and answers right. and, you know, you go back and forth. Right. It, this, it takes time. Uh, it, it's not a great amount of time, but it does take a little bit of time for the network to turn around. Okay. So if you're in Miami and talking to somebody in Tallahassee, when you finish transmitting, those radio over IP units need to go back to uh, the receive mode and sort of reset uh, and there's a I won't go into a lot of the, the, the technical stuff but there there needs to be some time delays so you we gotta say, reset the timeout timer yeah exactly and and uh, essentially and there are timeout timers on these uh, well I'll say there are timers on these radio over IP units to prevent uh, echoing and uh, like a, I forget what they call it, a ping ponging effect and stuff like that. So when a guy stops transmitting, wait. I usually like to say wait for your local Sarnet repeater to drop before you transmit. You know, or count 1001, 1002, and then transmit. You know, after the other guy stops transmitting. That's so everything can turn around and also because it's such a wide area, pausing just a little bit gives someone else a chance to get in if they need, you know, to make a call or use the network or, you know, whatever. Okay, so you just got to be aware of, of some of that. And that's why I say it's not a fast break system. You know, if somebody asks you a question, you know, that's like a one word answer or something like that, you know, hey, Eric, how are you doing today? I'm OK. And then, you know, you just don't come back right away. You know, hey, Eric, how are you doing today? I'm OK, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> that so, little delay in there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in in D star world, for those who are, mm -hmm. I, I use D star the most uh, for those who are wondering when I'm. When I'm on, um, you know, a reflector 30 Charlie or something, I'm talking. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the guys that are here in Vero Beach are talking, and you got a couple, a few repeaters and a reflector tied up. And what will happen is we used to call it black hole. I, oh, I black hole because nobody was leaving a delay. And by the time three minutes went on, and there's so fast of a conversation, now the repeater drops out. You lose everything. You don't hear nothing for three minutes until the thing resets. And that's a digital thing for D Star, so mm -hmm. that would that would happen. And everybody used to say, "Let it, let it wait till you get the beep. Give it two or three seconds, and then you know, you go again." Because, like you said, there's probably, I'm sure, there's not every single repeater in the Sarnet is the same. So some may have a little bit of a delay, an older unit versus a newer unit, yeah, and that, the, everything. That's that's something about Sarnet. This this network was cobbled together with equipment that's probably older than a lot of the hams out there. <laughs> okay, we're using GE Master 2 equipment, we're using ICOM equipment, we're using Midland equipment, we're using Motorola equipment. Uh, so it's, uh, we're, we're using uh, 
uh, let's see, uh, Hytera equipment too out there. So it, no telling what, what radio you're talking through out there, which of course is a big thing trying to get all this stuff to sort of sound the same and everything, and at least level wise and, and all. So there's a lot going out there behind the scene that you really don't, don't think or know about. So, uh, and it, I will say, if you get on the Sarnet site too, like, uh, like Eric mentioned, there's a lot of pages there that tell how it works. There's also uh, suggested operating practices. There's, you know, a frequently asked question page and, uh, and everything else. And, and all this equipment, it's old analog equipment. It's, it's wideband equipment. Wideband meaning not plus or minus 15 kilohertz like it was when I started, but it's plus or minus 5 kilohertz deviation. You don't want to program your radio for narrow band because you're going to be cutting your, your deviation by half and you're going to set, have real low audio, maybe not even key up some of the repeaters depending upon how your, your uh, CTCSS tone is, which I will mention too, this network does use CTCSS. It's an analog, you know, transmission. So you sort of have to, to realize that and, and levels and everything like that do make a make a difference yeah and so. and to the to the ones out there in ham radio land that uh <laughs> i run my mic gain on my icom 7100 at eight percent because people tell me at 15 i'm still way over driven so mm -hmm. always a lot of people think that you know maybe that came from the cb days or something where you had to crank your mic gain up because you're going to be heard more than others and that's not the case a lot of times if your mic gain is way hot and you got a system like this you're not going to have one person telling you to turn your mic game down. You're going to have a lot of them across the state. So get, you know, ask your friends or another ham one day, hey, you know, is this mic game? Nobody's ever given me a mic audio report. How is my audio level? Do I need to adjust it? And before you get on and tie up an entire state to find out for a radio check over, you know, 40 something repeaters, I mean, that's just. Well, I, I will say one of the things probably is a good operator you should do don't go testing on Sarnet move off to a simplex frequency. Uh -huh. It can be close by. You know, you can, you can listen to yourself on another radio, a handy talkie, or, you know, get, get together with a couple of guys. Move, move off frequency. You don't need to do testing on Sarnet. Uh, yeah. That's just, you know, normal good operating practice. I mean, years ago, well, we still do, but years ago, yeah, you know, you use a dummy load to, to test. And, and then you go on the air and you, you <laughs> make your brief transmissions. You know, yeah, you check, check the antenna to make sure you've got, uh, you know, reasonable standing wave and stuff like that. But uh, essentially, you can do just about everything off the air or at least on another frequency. Right. Yeah. Tie up that repeater nobody uses. Don't tie up the Sarnet. That's right. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. There you go, Eric. And tie up your local repeater. You know, a lot of local repeaters are sitting there not being used. Go ahead and use it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, uh, I, I mean, you know, we, we don't have any objections to people using Sarnet. Yes. Try not to. It, it's not really for rag chewing. But, I mean, we even have a group that gets on usually like every morning. I think a lot of them are like over in the Fort Myers area and stuff. And they'll get on there maybe for 15, 20 minutes. They have really pretty good, uh, uh, you know, operating procedure. They don't tie it up, you know, with, with very long transmissions. You know, they pass it around and stuff like that. That's not a problem. They don't get on there and kerchunk the repeater. Because you're kerchunking 35 or more repeaters when you do that. That's a relay and click on. That's a relay click on thirty-five different relays when you do that's that. That's right, and this is old equipment. And we're trying to keep it going, you know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, and it's not it's not good operating practice. I mean, try to use good operating practice, and that means, yeah, if you make a call, if you want to see if you're getting into a repeater, like go ahead and key up and say. This is WB4HIS testing. Don't use my call, of course, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but that's how I do it. At least yeah. give a call sign. We don't, it irritates the heck out of me, and I end up a lot of times disabling repeaters from the Sarnet network because somebody's just continually clicking up, you know, 
a well, half you, a dozen or more times. I, you I know? think it went more than that one time. Uh, somebody was in bad practice, and they actually had to locate their signal and, and, and find them. Wasn't oh, that not? We've had to do that a number of times, and uh, uh, other other things have been where people have used um, what APRS and not realize that they're not transmitting on VHF, that they're actually transmitting on UHF, and they actually ended up following a bunch of uh, of the repeaters on the way way up. They were headed out of state, I think, from like Orlando to Jacksonville or the other way around. I don't remember, but but in APR speakening is a real problem a lot of times. We haven't had too much lately, but it it occasionally tends to be a problem because it'll just sit there and you know we hear this burp, you know, of of data and and it just keys up the system and. Uh, same thing like with the uh, the wires system, I think it is. Some of the uh, radios that do Echolink, where they transmit a, a, a DTMF tone. That's a touch tone for people that don't know what DTMF is, but uh, dual tone, <laughs> multi-frequency. In the F key. Uh, yeah, the key exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, we don't, we don't like to have all this extraneous stuff. We don't like to have, uh, uh, oh, you know, what is it, the... Um, the timeout, uh, oh gosh, that's what happens when you get old, you forget about this stuff, but the... Uh, squelch tail? Uh, the squelch tail or the... Um, courtesy tone? Beeps, Cur courtesy beeps tone. Courtesy tone. Like, courtesy tone. Yeah, no I, no, I was corrected by somebody one time, uh, don't call it a Roger beep, it's a courtesy tone. I said, okay, well, you well know, you know, I, I know it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some some radio or some systems call them Roger beeps, you know, some uh, courtesy yeah. tone. and that. We, we don't want that stuff on there. We, we don't need touch tones on there. Yeah, a lot of radios uh, come, come if you buy one you know, from certain various things that yeah. there's an option for Roger Beep and sometimes, or the Wires X key for Yaesu Radio. That's right. Well, it That's puts right. out a 1750 hertz burst when you, when you push the button to get right. into the Wires network and you don't hear it, but everybody hears a beep. Hey, this is KJ4YZI, you know, and they hear that every time. You know, well, so. and then what happens too with some of that is it basically disables your mic audio for about the first second and a half. So we might hear the beep and then nothing else, and you've tried to talk or give your call sign, and it didn't come over the network because your audio is disabled for that time. Right. So, so you know, pay attention to that sort of stuff. As, a, as an operator, you ought to really pay attention to where you're transmitting, what you're transmitting, uh, you know, how, how your radio is, is functioning. That's why you, you know, supposed to have taken a test and know a little bit about radio and why the FCC lets us uh, use these frequencies and stuff. You know, that's a great, that's a great Good operator practice. That's a great parlay for me to give a plug to my sponsors, Joe. As, there I, you go. as I said in every podcast episode, folks, you've heard it and you've seen videos and people, you can read the comments that people have said, they get their license, but it's not memorizing out of a book. They've actually went through the interactive videos and the brain quizzes and electrical theory and principle to understand what they're testing for. And it won't teach you how to use the radio, but you'll know what calling CQ is, how a repeater functions, and why the FCC has these guidelines for ham radio and so much more. Ham radio prep, if you use the code ERICPODCAST20, you save 20% if you want to be a brand new tech or if you want to upgrade and get that general or extra. Save 20% with my code ERICPODCAST20 and you will totally have a little more of a grasp. Like he just said, you'll understand what do they say in CQ. But if you just if you if you watch those videos, you'll you'll see with graphics and people telling you on the screen what it means. And I know a lot of people have memorized just over and over through a book or an app. And then they just took the test. And then when you get on the repeater for the first time, they say, oh, you're talking Japanese to me. I have no idea how this repeater works. I just studied for the questions. That's not a good way to jump into ham radio, my opinion. So ham radio prep has been good for me. Hamradioprep.com. Thanks for being a great sponsor for me. And um, to all my Patreon uh, supporters as well. at patreon.com slash hamradioconcepts. Thanks for the charitable donations every month that you guys do. Um, Joe, we'll wrap it up here quick because I know I've taken too much of your time. But well, that's okay. We can go longer if you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, at some at some point I have to. Uh, oh yeah. Figure out dinner, but um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> we're not doing. We're we're, we're out of the. Uh, I'm, I'm out of the hurricane mode now because I've had everything prepared <laughs> for a while. Go. I've had every, everything prepared for a while, but uh, I'm tired of seeing it on the news now, and it's, yeah. I'd rather I'd rather get some podcasting edited and some videos done, but. Uh, so I'll just let's just wrap it up with this here. Uh, what do you think about 
the future of Sarnet. Uh, by the way, this if you haven't looked at the website yet, the SarnetFL.com, this is all, as he said, analog, and it is all UHF. So it's not mixed with VHF, UHF. Um, every one of the repeaters are UHF, correct, Joe? Uh, yes, all the repeaters are UHF. Uh, it was started out that way because we thought that there wasn't the activity that there was on, on VHF. Uh, a lot of the repeaters were not use that much and and the way we really looked at the system because this has been a test bed for how multicast works and for the DOT and everything and essentially we looked at this if, if you ever listen to a to a, a, a police dispatcher or a fire dispatcher and stuff like that that's generally how probably the DOT system is, is being used. You know, it's, there's a lot of listening, there's short transmissions. That's why we say really no, no rag chewing as such, you know, because it is, you know, statewide for, for one thing. But uh, uh, basically we, we were looking at it as, as more of a like public safety communication, at least reasonable type, type communication on there. Tell them about the EOC night on Wednesday real quick. Okay, yeah. Every, every Wednesday, um, there, are, uh, there is a net. And this is sponsored essentially uh, because the Department of Emergency Management is, is really the, the sponsor, I guess you could say, of SARNET, or at least the, the party responsible to FDOT. Uh, they run a, a net every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and all the amateurs that are authorized by their local county emergency coordinators will check in. They'll have a roll call, and they basically want to see how many of the emergency management centers and those amateurs are able to check in. And, and generally, I think we have about, maybe about half the counties, uh, maybe a little more, I think, that do check in. Now, you have to be um, authorized as a, uh, a communicator, I guess, from your, a local, your local emergency manager to be able to check into the net. Yes, That's don't check in if you're just a ham listening. That's not right. for the net. That's right. for EOCs right. and authorized But people. listen, because they'll do a roll call and you'll hear counties all around the state that'll that'll check into this. And it for one, it uh, it gives us an idea of how the network is operating, what sites that uh, we might be having a problem with, which generally is, is very little. Surprisingly, the, the network is, I would say, extremely reliable. Uh, you know, considering the the age of equipment, the um, uh, you know how it's set up and and, and everything. So uh, uh, it's basically though a check though of of the communications between the emergency management centers. I guess that's probably the easiest or best way to explain that. But uh, yeah, you know, listen. I mean, I always you know, growing up being a ham. You're supposed to listen a lot, you know. Transmitting is not so important sometimes. It's more fun listening. As Dr. Rich told me one time on the Love Doctors in West Palm, I used to listen to two ears, uh -huh. one mouth, listen twice as much as you talk. There you go. And there I do that go. a lot. I do that a lot because I, I like to learn more. I'll sit there in conversations and I'll I'll listen to people and and you know it's just uh, what I do. Sometimes my wife is the opposite. She wants to be in the conversation and I'll right. just sit back and listen because you know you learn a lot more when you listen. All right, and exactly. and that's and that's one of the things that you know they they don't teach you when you get a ham radio license. But I think a ham radio prep, the sponsor will even tell you, you know, listen before you transmit. See who's in there talking as your new person. If you're afraid to push that button first, or this, if you get a brand new ham license and you're listening to this podcast, and Sarnet's going to be your first check in ever, just listen a couple of hours and see how people communicate. Because when you jump in, you don't know who's on there, you don't know who's talking, you don't know what they talk about, you know. That's that's my opinion because it's always scary pushing that button the very first time. It is, you know. I 
Do you remember the first, first time CW that you? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but CW, you can't get anxious. It's just a paddle or a key. Yeah, well, right? that's that's you know? that's right. <laughs> and that's been a long time ago for me. <laughs> so, but uh, no, it, you know, have have fun. Definitely don't don't be afraid to use the network, but don't use it improperly. You know, that's the big thing. Don't don't be a kachunker. If if you want to. Yeah, see if your radio's working or you're making a repeater, make a test call. This is, in my case, WB4HIS testing out, you know? And, or, this is WB4HIS. Is someone out there can give me a radio check? Okay? Mm -hmm. Boom. That's it. Give a call sign, you know? Don't get on there. Don't, don't make funny noises. Don't be a bad actor. We have a lot of bad actors, and it's really not good for the network because we end up having to disable sites. It, it's, just, it's just not good. You don't know who's listening to this network, for one thing. And, that's, uh, that's another thing. You never know who's listening. I've been on a repeater before, and it was dead and silent, and I mean, I listened for days and days and struck up one conversation with somebody, haven't heard anybody in months on a, uh, not a Starnet repeater, some other one, and whatever we talked about, the person had to jump in and interject, and he said, I've been mm -hmm. listening to you guys for weeks, and I said, Oh, so there's always somebody listening out there. You never know who's listening. Yeah, and, and you don't know. And, and they, a lot of the emergency operations center, I know like Nassau County has, has radio operators that basically man up there pretty much 24 hours a day, I think. Because I hear them on there, they'll occasionally make a, a quick test to make sure they're getting into the, to the network and stuff. But it, it could be some emergency manager or... Who, who knows? Uh, it could even be could even be the governor as far as that goes. But because mm -hmm. uh, you just don't know who who might uh, you know. I know when when we had the building collapse down here that uh, um, uh, Jimmy Patronus, the state financial officer who is a ham, was down here and he was with one with uh, one of the operators from the state fire marshal's office and he was sort of introduced to sarnet and so he knows what it is and stuff but you just don't know who might not you know who who might be there listening and yep. we would like to really present a you know a good uh you know if you want to goof around go to a simplex frequency or go in Miami, there's plenty of repeaters that guys are acting up. <laughs> that's, the wild, the that's, that's the wild. That's the wild west. west. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I love talking to those guys at Simplex down there. When I had my oh, my yeah, two meter, those are good. I, I had my two meter amp on uh, in my in my car years ago, yeah. and my and my my big old six foot whip on there. I loved Simplex, and man, mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't find them on the repeaters, you darn sure to find them on the Simplex. I mean, they'd cover from Homestead to to uh, Coral Springs, to Tampa, oh, yeah. to Opelika. Palm and, Beach. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I know those guys are ruthless so. down there, but they're just, you know, they're yeah. not really hurting anybody, yeah. I don't think. They're just having no, fun. No, well, there. you know, it's, I, I don't particularly like it. It's not good. It's not really a lot of times in conformance with the rules. But I think on, you know, on this network, we really need to present a good, uh, I don't know what you would call it, uh, demeanor. Or, Here, let, let, me, let, me, let me change, let me say it a different way. And sure. ham, ham, ham radio is a hobby, but it's also a service. Yes. And, and, and you know, it, it, Sarnet needs to re, remain as a good option for a good service uh, without mm -hmm. somebody from emergency management or somebody listening to some bad actors and saying, is this, is this why this right. is set up across the state for this? No. You know, so, so you can't control what people are doing. But, yeah, um, exactly. You know, we, we, you know, but uh, most, most of the people are understanding but you got to have that person that just I well and and the thing is now you mentioned too like you know will this be around will sarnet around? yeah the there future the agreement. future the future uh sarnet at least uh looks like it will be around there is a uh, a memorandum of understanding like i say between the department of emergency management and the florida department of transportation uh, they have been accommodating us. Uh, it does, uh, you know, some of the things that go on on the network, uh, you know, have been done to, to uh, uh, keep Sarnet going. I mean, we have to have, uh, you know, IP addressing and different things like that, that that go on to support Sarnet, and the state is supporting that. And we would not like to lose that because somebody, you know, acts up or whatever. 
and uh, right. we need to we need to really be not just amateurs but professionals. I yep. think when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. so. Well, Joe, I've appreciated your time, buddy. And uh, oh, you're welcome. You know, when I started this podcast uh, earlier this year, I, I had this. One, I, I was doing it one hour uh, every Sunday. I had it on shortwave at the same time on WRMI. I canceled that for a while because I couldn't afford it. This doesn't really make any money to pay for the <laughs> shortwave station. But um, then I transitioned the last couple months to just a 15-minute episode a day, just whatever, no production at all. And people kind of like the more natural feel. And now I'm looking at it, we're at 50 minutes, and I'm sure people are going to say, did you turn around and start doing these hour-long episodes? <laughs> but but that just means we had a good uh, conversation and good talking. Yeah. So that was yeah. that was kind of cool. Uh, do you, uh, I haven't had a guest on here in several months, but Joe, I will. I did this for the last ones. I'll give you a minute or so. You can say what you can talk about whatever you want. The color of your socks, um, <laughs> your 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 social security, whatever. You, uh, <laughs> that was a joke. Whatever well, you want to talk about, a ham radio, but. Go ahead. The mic's yours for a minute or so. What do you want to say to the viewers or uh, listeners on here? All right. I'll... Ham radio, for me, when I start, I started out at 14 years old getting my novice ticket. Uh, I'm 70 now. Um, ham radio sort of spurred me to go into electronics, to go into engineering. Uh, I mean, I ended up graduating with the, from the University of Miami with a bachelor's of science degree. I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of Florida. Um, it's ham radio led essentially into my vocation and it's been a very, you know, good thing. Uh, it's what you make of it too and you know I think as long as you go into it um, uh, you know with a open mind and you know try to comply with the rules too the rules are there for orderly um, I guess living <laughs> so to speak you know that's that's what laws are for and everything and um, Really, I say it's, you know, ham radio has been, been great for me. I've, I've been licensed, I think it's over 55 years now. So. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've only been licensed 18 years. You, you well, make me feel like, how long, 40 years, you said 50 years? Uh, yeah, well, I was first licensed in, in June of 1966. Wow. You've seen, you've seen radios come a long way then, Joe. Well. Real radios glow in the dark. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, back then, too, you had to know Morse code. You don't have to nowadays. And you had to fix your own radio when it broke. Pretty much. I mean, the, the equipment that we had, we, we don't, <laughs> we don't have the, we didn't have the ICOMs and the Kenwoods and the Yezus and all that stuff back then. It was Collins. It was General Electric. It was Motorola. And to put a radio on amateur frequencies took a little bit of doing and generally help from your your Elmers and the other hams in the community. So uh, our the fact is I remember here uh, I was I was a novice when we put the first repeater on down here in Miami, and it was one of the uh, uh, it was a group of hams. Uh, uh, one of the hams, uh, I think, owned or was part owner of one of the uh, like land re mobile radio repair shops down here. So he was able to help us. But all the equipment essentially at that time was commercial. You had to, uh, and it was all tubes too. Mm -hmm. I didn't start seeing transistors until probably the 70s sometime. I remember when I saw my first tube. And uh, like a year after yeah. I got licensed, my buddy showed me a iMac 3-500Z, and, and he laughed all yep. the time. He said, I, I guess what I said was, wow, I've only seen these in pictures. <laughs> 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 he, always, he always brought that up. I remember I showed you a tube, and now I'm still wanting to go backwards and, and learn that older stuff. Well, because you know, it, 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 it was a lot of fun growing up. I had a lot of guys that, that, uh, that were my age and older that, that, that would help me and guide me. Uh, 
couple of guys that uh, helped me build my first amplifier, which was a pair of 4-400As. Uh, you know, so, so when my when my when my Drake L4B goes out, uh, my two 3-500s, you could you could walk me through fixing it then. Yeah, well maybe so. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll have to I'll have to know how to fix it. <laughs> but but you know you can fix it. So <laughs> yeah yeah, it, lo it looks uh, pretty 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 getting parts nowadays. Looks pretty yeah. dis discreet in there if that's the word. I mean it's very yeah. it doesn't look like I mean you, I just modified my Icom seventy one hundred in my truck. I had to pull the the uh, desolder jumper uh, diode sixty three sixteen. It looked like it's smaller than a speck of glitter. And I had to file oh, yeah. the end of my soldering iron tip down to where it was like a needle where it would stab you just to get this little <laughs> diode out. And then I'm like, okay, well, now I got wide open transmit uh, all the way. So now I was going to do the ALC mod that mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people said they suffer when I looked at it. Now you got on the other side, you got to get a 10 micro microfarad capacitor from one side of one speck of glitter to the mm -hmm. other side of another speck of glitter and solder it. I said, nope can't i mean you got a magnifying glass in that thing and the oh, tip yeah. of the soldering iron like a needle covers the the point i said now i'm not doing that so uh that's that's not like uh the old radios you could clearly see and load it up with solder and nowadays if you mess the speck of glitter up by accident your radio is dead yeah so, you know it's come a, come yeah, a long the, ways the newer radios really as far as i'm concerned really aren't made to work on no you know. All modular, uh, just replace the PA the deck, replace yeah. the receiver deck, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, it's only general, you, you don't essentially go down to the component level most of the time, I think, you know. It's, right. It, you know, with all the surface mount stuff and everything, and special components and proprietary components and stuff like that. You well, you know, without a schematic or a service yeah. manual, you'll never know what that component is because well, it's so small you can't print a letter on it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. You know, I mean, when I was growing up, we used to go down to the, to the ham radio store and, yeah, you needed a 6CL or a 6146 or whatever. And, you know, so they had tubes there. They had resistors, capacitors. A tube tester uh, at the drugstore. A tube tester at 7-Eleven. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those were the days, man. Let me yeah. tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Go down with a box of tubes. <laughs> well, this has been a great, anyway. uh, great conversation. Uh, to, to wrap it up for everybody, um, if, if for some reason you just found this podcast and you're not one of the 20,000 downloads so far in the last... Uh, six months um you can go anywhere a podcast you just go to google and type in ham radio concepts podcast you'll see it on iHeartRadio, um uh, spotify deezer uh amazon audible google podcasts uh spreaker even your phone apple podcasts it's it's there and you could uh you know look at whatever episodes i have uh and also if you're new to the podcast and have no idea what ham radio is at all you can check out more stuff of what we do on youtube if you type in ham radio concepts in youtube you'll see the channel and there's eight years of videos there so uh you can learn a lot more and follow along and you never know where uh what video will come out next but this podcast is basically just kind of me just being creative and not caring and just being natural and so far the emails at ham radio concepts at gmail.com also agree. Just be you. Just don't put all this garbage production in there. Just talk, and we love hearing it. So that's where I went with the podcast. So thank you, uh, Mr. Joe, for okay. being being on here. And uh, the website, again, is sarnetfl.com. Um, you know, maybe I'll hear you on Sarnet. Just don't get on there like the one yeah, guy did. Oh, like the one guy did. Oh, you're a celebrity. I love your YouTube videos. You don't have to bring that up on Sarnet. I don't. If you hear it on Sarnet, just... Uh, Whatever you know, if if you hear me on her one day and you well, and, to... and don't be afraid to get on Sarnet and and ask for help either. I mean, there's a lot of guys on there. There's there's a oh, pretty yeah. good uh, repository of knowledge, uh, you know, throughout the state there. And and you know, don't be afraid to ask a question either. And then you got then you got uh, I think it's Pat up there. Where man, Pat, if there's yeah. if there's if there's a severe weather alert in a county. You know, he, he, he could bring it up on, you know, I've heard it before, yeah, where, hey, there's a tornado on the ground here at Escambia County. It's heading this way, and and uh, I'm 400 miles from there. But, you know what, somebody up there may be listening, or perhaps, uh, you know, uh, uh, hurricane warnings, or if there's uh, any kind of alerts like that that come out um, that are very imperative to people that are on the highways uh, traveling, listening to Sarnet, 
there's information out there. And uh, mm -hmm. if you just keep it tuned on Sarnet, you might hear a lot of stuff that oh, could yeah. be beneficial to uh, your traveling or the safety and, and, and that. So a lot of good information. And like you said, a lot of smart people on there. Yeah. I, I sort of consider Pat the, the mayor of Sarnet. That's what I call him, the mayor of Sarnet. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if he was actually labeled that per, per you. But uh, that's, a, that's a made up. But, well, I, maybe I labeled him. But he's on there a lot. We have the most transmission out of the Madison repeater than any of the other repeaters, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Because what we, I will tell you, we do, we do monitor Sarnet. We can tell whenever a repeater is accessed, we know which repeater it is. Yep. We know how long it's been transmitting. Yep. Uh, we can control it. Um, and we also, I probably have most, uh, I have a lot of recordings. We record essentially everything that goes over Sarnet. Oh, yeah. Yep. So be aware of that, too. Yeah, uh, I can I can tell uh, what repeater uh, someone is transmitting on, and we've got the audio, and we can match it up just fine, and you know, so there's no no question there about. about yeah, Laura, Laura Smith answers her phone if you're really bad. We could just call Laura. <laughs> <and> <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but if you hear me or uh, or you on there, Eric, because I know you know a lot about Sarnet too, and. Uh, uh, you know, Randy, AG4UU, or, or Brian, KC5LPA, or Pat, uh, don't, don't hesitate to, to give us a call, especially if you've got a technical question about Sarnet. We'd be happy to, to try to answer it on there. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you again, Joe. I'm going to wrap this up here. It's the first uh, 61 minute episode I've done in many months. So <laughs> I, I'm going to have to listen back to it myself in the vehicle. Uh, when I'm driving you can probably and... cut a lot out. No, nope, not cut nothing out. So <laughs> we're just going to send it. I can hit the upload button and just send cool. it off. <laughs> but it was All fun. Right. So, and if you have any, uh, if anybody listening has any topics or want to have a, if you've got a network like this in another state and you want to talk about it for a little bit, uh, we'll maybe keep it a little bit briefer, but we could uh, get on here and send me an email, hamradioconcepts at gmail.com, and let's talk about your uh, statewide Colorado network that you've designed for 20 years and what makes it different and how it's working and, and uh, what you've used it for with some cool stories and different natural disasters. That'd be cool to hear for an episode. So yeah. thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks to my sponsors. Thanks for my special guest, Joe. Thanks to uh, everybody on Patreon, and more videos and podcasts are on the way. Hopefully everybody in the Big Bend area, Panhandle, or wherever this hurricane decides to go uh, is safe and prepared and has uh, no issues. But if you got a ham radio, uh, you'll use that when all your cell phone yeah. and Wi-Fi goes down. So <laughs> make, make, make sure you listen to your local uh, broadcasts, your local weather stations. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, that's what's important. Sarnet's not really a, a, a weather disseminator as such, but we do let people know when there is stuff going on. And then it's up to you to tune in your local sure. stations. There. Sure. And and there may be repeaters out there that we don't even know about that are very right. I mean, I mean, we have one in St. Lucie County that uh, when I was doing Skywarn, I got to re renew my Skywarn, but uh, when the summertime and, and we'd have uh, tornadoes and stuff and uh, National Weather Service would get on from National Weather Service in Melbourne would get mm -hmm. on to the St. Lucie 146775 with mm -hmm. Bud Holman and Wayne on there. And uh, I would check in if I you know, had eyes on the ground or whatever. And weather servers took that information from the um, Skywarn spotters that were on the repeater. And they would just monitor the traffic, too. And, yeah. uh, you know, so there's, there's repeaters out there in other states and countries and counties that are not affiliated with Sarnet at all. But you, you probably have a Skywarn presence in your area. And uh, like I said, in general... If you have a ham radio, when the cell phone and the Wi-Fi goes out, a ham radio will definitely be a, a way to get information. If you can't get TV and broadcast and everything else, that's your backup, you know. And, and yeah. sometimes you'll hear it on the radio before it hits that ticker on the uh, TV, you know. So um, until next time, we'll put out a video tomorrow, a podcast tomorrow. Thanks, Joe, and I uh, hope you like the uh, hope you like the time with me today, sir. You're welcome, Eric. Uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. We can do it again sometime if you like. All right, sure. and uh, let me stop this here at 64 minutes and 8 seconds. This is uh, KJ4YZI with WB4HIS. 7-3.